I don't know if you have ever asked God when. God, when are you going to work in this situation? When are you going to change the circumstance? When are you going to fulfill your promise? When will there be justice? It is a painful question that I think resonates deep within us. When, God? I've asked God when so many times in my life. When are you going to restore the brokenness in my family? When will my siblings be restored to their salvation? Maybe your when is, when will you provide me with a partner to share my life? Or God, when will you heal me? God, when will you break the chains of injustice? Waiting is hard. Imogen has an advent calendar and she is learning how hard waiting can be. In the lead up to Advent, every day she would ask me, can I open the window and get my lolly yet? And then I would see her hopeful face fall when I said, not yet. But learning to wait is not just tricky for our little people, it's hard for us too. It's hard for me. In January this year, a few of the young adults joined me in a new year shred. A shred is a bodybuilding term, a term that describes a season when someone intentionally restricts their calorie intake and focuses hard on their fitness goals to shred extra weight and typically see big growth, muscle gain. And so we decided to do a spiritual shred where we started the new year by shredding the old distracting habits and started new habits of prayer and scripture to see hopefully big growth in our lives. It was hard, but it was actually an amazing process. And so we decided to finish the year the way we started with 30 days of spiritual shred. This time around, we are reading the Psalms side by side with the Gospels. One of the things that has really struck me as I've read these big chunks this week is the humanity that we see displayed in David's Psalms. I've discovered that often David is crying out, God, when? In Psalm 4, he says, answer me when I call. O oh God, who declares me innocent, take away my distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. How long will you people ruin my reputation? How long will you make these groundless accusations? In deep anguish, David spends many of the Psalms laying out for God his dread and hurt and confusion, as well as his joy and gratitude. These are deeply moving deeply personal, deeply authentic accounts to a God who hears his heart. I think one of the most painful parts of the human experience at times of waiting, and often we find in those times of waiting, what we're actually waiting for is God's perfect timing. We see this theme run all the way through the stories of God's people in Genesis, people who have been given a promise or a dream, but they have been required to wait. And today I want to start an online series, which we will carry over the next few months, titled Vision in the Valley. I know the valley is not really a word we associate with somewhere we want to be, is it? When I think of the valley, I think of the famous Psalm 23, even though I walk through the darkest valley. And for me, there's a sense of foreboding about the valley. Maybe that it's in the valley that in fact evil is lurking. Certainly the place of waiting can feel like being stuck in a valley. But consider this, J.K. Chesterton said, one sees great things from the valley, only small things from the peak. Could it be possible that our fear of the valley stops us from embracing all the moments of greatness and gratitude and deep learning to be gleaned while waiting in the valley? 
This is particularly obvious when we consider the life of Joseph. Joseph is the 11th son of Jacob and he is the first son of Rachel. And that is a curious, so earmark that because we will come back to it. Joseph was more loved by his father than any of his brothers. He was a dreamer. Joseph was the subject of a plot to murder by his very own brothers, and he was sold into Egyptian slavery. He was a gifted leader, and he was favoured by God. He was accused of being a rapist and thrown into jail. He interpreted dreams through the power of God. He was wise and influential, and he eventually became the second most powerful man in Egypt, ruling next to Pharaoh through one of the world's worst famine, one of the world's, one of the country's worst famines that it had experienced in its history. And Joseph spent much of his life waiting, and much of his waiting in what we might consider the valley. Let's read some of his story together from Genesis 37, 2 to 11. It says, this is the account of Jacob and his family. When Joseph was 17 years old, he often tended his father's flocks. He worked for his half brothers, the sons of his father's wife, Bilah and Zilpah. But Joseph reported to his fathers some of the bad things his brothers were doing. Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other children because Joseph had been born to him in his old age. So one day, Jacob had a special gift made for Joseph, a beautiful robe. But his brothers hated Joseph because their father loved him more than the rest of them. And they couldn't say a kind word to him. One night, Joseph had a dream, and when he told his brothers about it, they hated him more than ever. Listen to this dream, he said. We were out in the field tying up bundles of grain. Suddenly, my bundle stood up, and your bundles all gathered around and bowed low before mine. His brothers responded, so you think you will be our king, do you? Do you actually think you will reign over us? And they hated him all the more because his dreams and the way he talked about them. Soon Joseph had another dream and again he told his brothers about it. Listen, I had another dream, he said. The sun, moon and 11 stars bowed low before me. This time he told his dream to his father as well as to his brothers but his father scolded him. What kind of dream is that? He asked. Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow to the ground before you? But while his brothers were jealous of Joseph, his father wondered what the dreams meant. There's some serious twists and turns to come in the life of Joseph and his family. And in fact, this particular moment in history takes us from chapter 37 all the way through to the end of Genesis in chapter 50, with one slight parallel narrative about his brother Judah in chapter 38, but bookmark that story too. This is a sizable chunk of the book of Genesis for one guy. The story of Joseph is a really important part of the history of Israel. And we know that stories matter in the Jewish tradition. In fact, most cultures are built on the stories that we tell ourselves about who we are and how we came to be here in this moment. I think our Indigenous brothers and sisters have so much to teach us about the power of understanding who we are about an oral tradition of telling each other where we came from. The Bible is full of those kind of stories. The whole Bible, while a collection of many books by many authors, is one big story of God. And it is a story that we are mercifully invited into as a part of the family of God. 
We have a few people in our world who are like family to us. And so we include them in our family celebrations and into our home and we just invite them to share our lives with us. They have become like old, comfortable furniture. But sometimes because we are so familiar around these people, we let our guard down a little and uh, we start to act authentically in front of them. And so sometimes they hear me growl at my kids and sometimes they see my dirty floors. And every now and again, they have to sit through a super awkward, passive aggressive conversation that Damien and I might very occasionally find ourselves in. I can always see on their faces that they have switched from comfortable, glad to be included here to awkward, should I be here for this mode? As we read these chapters about Joseph's family, a story that is messy and complicated and unexpected but real, it's kind of the same experience. We go from being super glad we're included to awkwardly wondering if we want to stick around. But before we get all smug thinking, thank goodness this isn't my real family, I just want you to know that this is your family and actually it gets worse because the niggling and the family fighting and the bad choices in the story of Joseph is indeed a picture of you and me. Actually, all of Genesis is a reflection of us, revealing what deep down we know to be true of our own story. And so we're going to park here with Joseph and his family over the course of this series to see what we can learn. Some of the things that we can learn about Joseph's family require us to look back a little further because there are some portions of his family's story of origin which reveal to us patterns of behaviour that belong not just to the Israelite family DNA, but actually to all human DNA. We need to understand how it is that Joseph and his family land in the big picture context of Genesis. Now, you might be inclined to think that you know the story of Genesis, that you've, you know, read this a stack of times before and that this is just basic stuff. Or, you know, maybe you've covered Genesis in children's church and you know it like the back of your hand. But can I challenge that thinking today? I actually think it's possible that we miss some really important things when we skim through Genesis or we treat these scriptures with an unholy familiarity, convinced that there is nothing new to learn here. Because the Bible is self-revealing. And that means that if you are open to learning about yourself, there is always something new to learn in each of these chapters. In fact, honestly, I missed some really important parts of this story as I prepared this message, and they were things that I think revealed portions of my own broken heart. So Genesis starts with creation. God spoke, the universe existed, and then sin entered the world through the choices of Adam and Eve. And we learn immediately in the story of Cain and Abel just how depraved humanity sinks in this now sinful world. So bookmark that because that is an important point. Humanity is so sinful that God just decides that it isn't working. And the Bible says God's heart was broken as he looked on the evil of man. Actually, God says he is sorry he ever made man and he determines to wipe out all of humanity. But one man finds favour with God, Noah, and so God makes him a promise to redeem mankind. Very quickly after that, the people conspire to build a tower and God again is frustrated and he scatters the people of the earth. But out of this moment, we meet Abram and God chooses to bless him and to use him to establish God's chosen people. God promises old Abram and his old wife a baby. And this is our first moment of seeing people called into a moment of wait. 
But Abraham takes matters into his own hands, trying to rush God's promise by getting busy with his wife's servant. And this does not turn out well. Yet God redeems by fulfilling his promise to Abram and they are given their son Isaac miraculously. Isaac and his wife Rebecca have twins. And Genesis tells us that those twins struggled inside Rebecca's womb for position and the Lord promised that the sons would become rival nations. The twins are born through this strange story of strings and arms and a muddled birth order. And finally, we meet Jacob, Joseph's father, and his uncle Esau. What unfolds next is a story of family competition rivalry, division, and posturing for greater position and greater blessing. And what much of it boils down to is that Jacob doesn't want to wait to be blessed. Yet in the midst of all the messiness and chaos and self-promotion, God still chooses to redeem Jacob, giving him dreams and blessing him and his family. Jacob meets Rachel and he falls in love with her, but Jacob's father-in-law, Laban, tricks Jacob, like Jacob had tricked his own father and brother, and Jacob marries the wrong woman, Leah. Jacob makes a new deal and he takes Rachel, Joseph's mum, as his second wife a week later. But Rachel and Jacob, like Isaac and Rebecca and Abraham and Sarah, they can't get pregnant. And so again, they don't wait for God, but instead Leah and Rachel get into this child war with lots of servant babies until finally God remembers Rachel and she gives birth to her first son, Joseph. God meets with Jacob in multiple dreams and he blesses him. And finally, we hit chapter 37, where we hear about 17-year-old Joseph's dream. There's a lot of threads in this story, I know, and you might even feel overwhelmed trying to make sense of all of the characters and the subplots and the imagery. But there are a couple of things that I want to draw out for us. I really want to first lean into the big picture story of Genesis. Because we see very quickly that man is sinful by nature. And like any story we tell ourselves as a culture or a people group, we feature here too. We are supposed to recognise that this brokenness and the self-serving behaviours and even the pain is our story too. And like Noah and Abraham and Jacob, we mess up. We war with siblings or family or each other, and it's incredibly destructive. But it's a fact that is in the fabric of people right from the opening chapters of this book, and it continues to be a part of our story today. We read of a humanity that is so depraved and evil that God wishes he never made it. We also see over and over again that despite our human mistakes and rivalry and competition, God continually looks for ways to wade into the story to bring about his plan of redemption. And despite their failings, God still looks to act in the life of Noah and Abraham and Jacob and now in the story of Joseph. And because we are supposed to see some of our own reflection, God is telling us through these stories that he wants to act to redeem our events and relationships and the circumstances of our lives too. Now that's super important for us as we frame the context of Genesis because like the people throughout the chapters 1 to 50, I am capable of mistakes and rivalry and competition And yet God has done the work of redeeming me back to righteousness. So God redeems broken people. There's also a narrative that repeats again and again in the genealogy of Joseph. And what I know about repetition in story is that we should pay attention to it. An author uses repetition to teach us something or to highlight something. It's like in this moment, the author is writing in bold, underlined italics. (laughs) The repeated narrative here is perhaps people who refuse to wait. Instead, they try to manipulate God or to make his promises come true themselves in their own strength. 
Abraham and Sarah promised a baby, but it doesn't happen quickly enough. And so they step in and they intervene and they have Ishmael with Sarah's servant as a result. Jacob and Rachel can't get pregnant. So the two sisters engage their servants to build their own families and create massive family tension and competition. When I hold these stories up and I look at how they reflect something of my own character, I can see that at times in my life, I've grown weary of waiting and I've tried to make things happen in my own strength. Just thinking that if I could, you know, give God a hand, that I could get the ball rolling. And my broken humanity is painfully obvious to me in the stories of these people in Genesis who grapple with the same ideas and behaviours that I grapple with thousands of years later. I wonder if you can see a little of your own brokenness reflected in these stories. Are we too quick to despise that valley, to want to rush the waiting, desperate to move out of the discomfort of growing? Do we miss the opportunities to see God use our stories to shape the lives of the people around us? Sometimes, church, God asks us to wait. Let's just take a little moment to shine the light on Jacob here. Both Jacob and Joseph come from a feuding family and knew the tension and destructive nature of disunity. Both Jacob and Joseph experienced God speaking to them in dreams. God had his hand on both Jacob and Joseph despite the unlikely circumstances and paths they took. In chapter 32, verse 22, Jacob actually wrestles with God and he commands God's blessing on his life and God miraculously gives it to him. But we see a different response from the two men. Jacob's pursuit of God appears to be primarily about himself and his own blessing. I think think that we would expect that Jacob will recognize God speaking prophetically in Joseph's dreams. Maybe we expect Jacob to help Joseph outwork that dream, to foster it and to mentor his son. But instead, Jacob reprimands Joseph for verbalizing God's vision. And then he sends his son off to negotiate the family tension of his much older brothers alone. Has Jacob experienced God's blessing in his own life and now, upon seeing it in Joseph's life too, become too self-interested to share, mentor and foster the blessing of God in his son? Maybe. Is it possible that Jacob has already forgotten what God did for him and his family in the valleys of his own life? I think that's the point of the stories, right? The stories are a narrative that we tell ourselves about who we are and where we come from. The Jewish tradition of festivals and ceremonies, they serve to remind the people individually and corporately who they are and who their God is. It's a reminder that God is at work, even when we are waiting, even when we are broken. Look, though, at how Joseph responds to the waiting. Joseph takes every opportunity to the point to the faithfulness of God and God blesses him. But recognize this, God doesn't bless Joseph for Joseph's benefit. He blesses him because God's hand is at work in the chaos and the mess of Joseph's circumstances. It's a testament to the power and goodness and faithfulness of the God of Israel, the God who has a plan to rescue his people and who graciously chooses to invite us into the story. Each of these verses points us to moments in Joseph's life where he points to God as the person that is doing the work and not himself. But let's not 
underestimate how painful waiting can be. Remember those Psalms of David, his anguishing as he waits to see God move in justice and mercy. We are being given permission to be authentic about the pain, but we also must learn to recall God's goodness to us in those moments of weariness. This is a message to myself, of course. How quick am I to forget yesterday's blessings, looking to the new, the fresh, the quick? How quickly do I forget all the doors that God has opened and the revelations that he has provided and the goodness that he has poured out? How quickly I forget that this story isn't actually about me. It's about Jesus and his act of redemption through our King Jesus. In the waiting, in the valley, is our attention on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, or is our attention on ourselves? Listen to David's words as he reminds his soul who Yahweh is. The Lord is my light and my salvation, so why should I be afraid? The Lord is my fortress, protecting me from danger, so why should I tremble? When evil people come to devour me, when my enemies and foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though a mighty army surrounds me, my heart will not be afraid. Even if I am attacked, I will remain confident. The one thing I ask of the Lord, the thing I seek most, is to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, delighting in the Lord's perfections and meditating in his temple. For he will conceal me there when troubles come. He will hide me in his sanctuary. He will place me out of reach on a high rock. And then I will hold my head high above my enemies who surround me. At his sanctuary, I will offer sacrifices with shouts of joy, singing and praising the Lord with music. I want to give you a really practical step to take away today. Do you feel like Joseph waiting? Is your weary soul like David's crying out to God when? Today, I want to ask you not to just let the words of this message wash over you, unchanging your habits and practices, but I want to encourage you to remember the stories of God's faithfulness. Like David, write your psalm today. Allow your heart to anguish in whatever you are feeling, whatever your whens might be, but then Remind yourself of who God is. Remind your soul today of our majestic God who has always been working in the broken places to bring about his big story of redemption. Like Joseph, in your valley of waiting, direct your heart to Jesus. Our story of origin is messy and complicated, but Jesus has invited us into his story of great hope. So let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have a story and that you have a plan and that you have graciously invited us into the hope that you have brought through your son, Jesus. Father, we pray for the anguish and the pain and the brokenness that we experience for the moments of when that we sit in. Father, we pray that your spirit would bring your power, your hope and your peace to each of those moments to allow us to wait on the perfect timing of our good, good God who continues to redeem us through your son. In your mighty name, amen. Bless you, church.